Yes, I can. Yeah. I've just gone live. So let's see how this this goes. All right. So are you good to go? How are you? Checking yes, good in? to go, mate. Yes. How are you checking in? I'm checking in really well, thank you very much. Yes, okay. it's uh, life's good, very busy, um, and lots of new things happening. So that's uh, is is all good, and the team's all good, family's all good. So I'm touching wood, and uh, just going with that positive, <laughs> that positive vibe. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, I'm checking. Very excited to have you here, and uh, been looking forward to this. And when we we didn't connect at 11 o'clock, I thought, oh, fuck, no, he's, <laughs> something's come up. And anyway, so I really, I'm really uh, been looking forward to this and really appreciative of, of this. Do you just want to give us an introduction of who you are and what your role is? Yes, yeah, certainly. My name's Jim Cunningham, and I'm lucky enough to be the manager of something called the Community Peer Mentors, which is part of the Durham Police and Crime Commissioner's Office in, uh, in the UK. Um, we were set up about eight years ago. Uh, my background is that uh, I was in the army for 13 years and then in the police uh, for 23 um, and set up things such as uh, joint domestic and child abuse uh, units. I was a family liaison officer for murders and suspicious deaths. I also did firearms and worked in counter-terrorism for a bit. So basically never worked a day <laughs> life, just played um, and I then went on to something called the Hillsborough Investigation, which was the investigation of the death of 96 football fans at a football match uh, with from Liverpool. And then after that, I uh, saw this job advertised in uh, 2015 and decided to apply for the post. And here we are eight years later and we're still going strong. Great stuff. Mm. All right. So you've got a presentation for us today. Indeed, yes, yeah. I mean, David's been kind enough to ask me to come and uh, share with everybody or whoever watches this about what the Community Peer Mentors does uh, in County Durham, which is a, a fairly small county in uh, the northeast of, of, of England. And uh, David, we worked with him for the last two to three years, which has been wonderful and trained uh, lots of our, well, or nearly all our staff and volunteers in uh, Recovery Coach training which has been absolutely wonderful in support of vulnerable and isolated people as it says they're uh, affected by significant life-changing events and David just wanted us to sort of go through and show people what we do but also more importantly how we got there in the first place so I will whiz through this and then uh, you know if David's got any questions on your behalf as we go through then we can we can cover those or you know I know David will at some stage ask me some questions which is brilliant um so the objectives of the community peer mentors um first of all the the full background to this is that the police and crime commissioner at the time um the previous police and crime commissioner who sadly passed away um wanted to introduce something that helps support people prior to them getting into the criminal justice system but also to reduce demand uh, on frontline services, especially the police, because they, he wanted to find out if, if actually did the people who always contact the emergency services and included in that are social services, the councils, the NHS, the fire service, uh, GPs, as well as the police, if they had anything in common. Um, so I saw the job advertised and I thought, yes, that's something that really floats my boat and something I believe that we can make a difference. So I thought I would just copy what everybody else was doing in the UK to support these types of things and found out that it was uh, was a, an area or a cohort of people that weren't actually being catered for because invariably it was those who fell down the cracks in society, which was great. So that meant we had a clear page and I could introduce something I thought um, would help people. And luckily enough, after eight years, we can still prove that that uh, our approach is not only unique, but it is beneficial to lots of people. So the objectives were to reduce the demands on frontline services, to improve the statutory agency's response to what are referred to as high impact users or frequent flyers, or sometimes referred to as the, those in the, that are a pain in the backside, or you know we keep 
doing the same thing again and again and again. And they felt, uh, as it says there, that nationally, the feedback from vulnerable people, especially those who have gone through mental health services, they're left feeling angry, frustrated, disenfranchised by professionals because you have the professionals telling people how they should live their lives and not really understanding what the impact is for that individual. Because just because you read a book on something or you've worked in an environment for a long period of time, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know how that person feels. I could read a book on flying a plane, but you wouldn't want to be a passenger on that plane. You need somebody with that lived experience who's going to have that knowledge and expertise to, to guide people through. So that was what I was set out with. Um, and how were we going to achieve this? So we did use something called a, um, a problem set solving approach, which uses something called the SARA model. Um, and it's from problem orientated policing. It was invented in America in the 70s, going into the 80s, uh, somebody called uh, Goldstein. And um, so we followed that process. And it's one of those processes that you keep going to, you revisit and then start to um, solve the problems as you see it so the scanning side of it we were looking at what creates a high impact user um, so we looked at the office of national statistics and said that over 3 million people aged 65 live alone um, that public health england estimated seven percent of 18 to 64 year olds are socially isolated and that's quite often because of the oxymoron which is called social media which was invented by people who didn't want to be sociable and now what we have is a, a large majority of the population spending lots of time in their bedroom, being not having social, real social contact and living in a bit of a dream world. <clears throat> now, based on the size of County Durham, that would have meant we have a potentially 41,000 people who are socially isolated in, in County Durham. Now, that doesn't mean that they're all unhappy. Um, some people are quite happy in their, in their own space, um, they can have elected social isolation. So people might go out and have very busy social lives for a couple of days a week, but actually quite like being at home. Um, but there are a number of people who then create their own monsters, have issues around alcohol and substance misuse because they self-medicated. And we were trying to find out, well, what does create, what do these people have in common that would make them a high impact user on social services? So... Uh, when I started this in 2015, I wanted to do part of the scanning was, you know, what, what does bring all these people to the table? So we, um, we looked at all 999 calls and 101 calls into the police control room just from August 5th, 2015 to January 16th. So not a particularly big area at all, but um, that was still bringing in over 90,000 calls to the police. And when we drilled it down, we could see, as it says there, 378, which is 0.06% of the population, made on average around 4% of all calls. And then when we drilled down further, we end up with a real high, strong core of 52 people across County Durham and Darlington um, who made over 2,000 calls. And so you're starting to think, well, these people, that was just in that that four month period, my goodness, what are they like over a 12 month period, over a two year, five year, 10 years, some of these have been ringing the police forever. So we did some detail analysis based on this and we found that those 52 people accounted for over 35,000 staff hours. And that comes in at a cost of around 2.1 million pounds, which the public don't appreciate because when you ring 999 or the doctors or social services, the bottom line is, people feel it is free and, and it isn't so we wanted to look to see what these people had in common so based on the analysis of all the information i decided we'd look at three areas which is community client and organization uh, the community to re the reduction in poor behavior because if you have somebody who's got very bad behavior constantly in contact with the police and, and, and it, if it's negative or it becomes violent it has an impact on the community community then lose respect or feel they're being let down by the powers who should be making the community a decent place to live in so we wanted to look at that side of it 
And then we looked at the client and we uh, decided we wanted to engage with them at a different level, not with um, a big stick, which the police come come with, social services come with, probation services come with, sometimes the NHS come with. If you don't take this, we won't give you this. We'll take your house off you. We'll take your kids off you. We will arrest you. Um, all these things are not really a carrot. It's just the stick. And I felt that we need to engage with people at a different level and how we were going to do that. But then also looking at the organisations by reducing demand, you reduce confrontation and then the negative impact on the staff and the mental health and well-being of those staff. Because if you're constantly going to the same house day in, day out, you feel as a professional that you're letting that individual down. And so that has an impact on you. Then if you get assaulted or if you get a complaint against you, that has a negative impact with you outside work and on your family. So there's lots of moving parts to this. But we wanted to avoid displacement um, and leaving clients feeling rejected. Uh, and quite often with professionals, they have very set criteria. You know, mental health services won't necessarily engage with somebody if they're still taking substances or alcohol. Um, Alcohol services won't touch people if they're taking substances. Sometimes substance uh, workers won't touch people if they're taking alcohol, if they're committing crime. And there's lots of barriers. So that was another consideration. But also, we didn't just want to move one person to one place to another because we wanted to challenge that poor behaviour and preconceived ideas, not just of the individual, but of also the organisations and community. Because somebody who's presenting in one way quite often well there will always be a backstory but we wanted to find out that backstory and help support that person and raise awareness perhaps with the community and organization if they were sort of happy to do so so based on that analysis the aims of the community peer mentors were to support vulnerable and isolated people affected by significant life-changing events and those significant life-changing events are your death divorce debt uh, unemployment, underemployment, early retirement. Um, and it's not one size fits all with significant life changing events. Being the victim of crime is a bit life, a significant life changing event. Being a perpetrator and being arrested is a life changing event. Um, all of which people react to in different ways. Death is a classic, you know, we, you might have an, an, a, an auntie that you really detest and when she passes away, you go, oh, well, you know, we'll go to the funeral and that's it. On the other hand, you can have a pet that passes away and your life will fall apart. So it's not just saying, oh, well, they've had a death, therefore they get one point. Be, you know, if you're trying to make some analysis on individuals, it has to be taken on the impact of the individual. And based on that, I didn't want to be descriptive in who we would support. So it is, we were happy to support and we will support victims, survivors, perpetrators, those forgotten by society, whether their perception or reality of whether they're a victim or, or perpetrator or not. Um, because some people might think that they are a victim of something but actually when you talk to the street they are the perpetrator and then you get sort of getting into that drama triangle of who moves between what or how they perceived their reality um who through unfulfilled needs uh, become reliant on emergency services because the bottom line is they're 24 7 people think it's free and invariably when you talk to them you speak to a nice person whether you know, even GPs, receptionists, you know, there are some lovely people there. Uh, and then you get an appointment or the police come round, or the fire service or the ambulance. And people are treated with dignity and respect most of the time. And that fulfills their social contact needs. But actually, there's got to be a better way to it because there's still that embarrassment afterwards. And that after the sugar rush of attention, you're then still left in your house on your own and quite often with the issues around drugs, alcohol, mental health, or anything else. So we were also wanted to reduce the severity and frequency of their calls, thereby reducing their vulnerability and empowering them a change. <coughs> the re reason it says severity and frequency is initially we'd said that we'd stop people calling the emergency services. Uh, and that not only turned out to be quite dangerous, because some people will, if they 
if their world is that you do as you're told and if I've been told by Jim not to ring the police then even if my house is burning down or I'm being burgled I won't call the police because Jim told me not to and also some people enjoy the excitement of ringing 999 but if you can reduce how often they do that and that when they're ringing it's for a suspicious vehicle now which takes one person and one call for five minutes rather than that that person claiming they're going to be kidnapped or it's going to be shot and there's a massive great influx of police officers which cost thousands of thousands of pounds or the fire service turning out then that looking at those words of severity and frequency still means that that person's achieving something but also we're not putting unrealistic barriers on that person saying you mustn't call the police or us saying to stakeholders we will stop people calling you uh, because then everybody feels that they've let each other down and that way we i felt that we could reduce demand on frontline services uh, and statutory services so in april 2016 with the agreement of the police and crime commissioner at the time and also joy allen who's our current police and crime commissioner who very much is very supportive of this service and continues to fund us um i decided that the buying from them had to be we would recruit volunteers with lived experiences and colorful pasts so it didn't matter what somebody's background was like if they wanted to help others and they've been through the processes and through our um, recruitment program that we would take them on. And so people who have even just come out of prison, people in recovery from drugs and alcohol, all those sorts of things. So we prepared a, a training program that lasted um, uh, 10 weeks and we established a referral criteria. Um, and the bottom line is that our response <laughs> was basically that we wanted to recruit people with lived experience and colorful pasts we wanted to keep the criteria open so included not excluded we said that we couldn't be badged of anything that was the police because that's a barrier and then you people feel that they're being spied on so we go on behalf of whatever organization makes the referral and at the same time we make sure um that we're open and honest with them. And because we're not a statutory organization, we don't come with a big stick. We're just there for them in any way, shape or form they wish. And when a referral is made to us, we go as an extension of that organizational team because people, professionals love the word signposting because it sounds nice, neat and tidy. And it feels like we've done something. However, when you speak to the public, signposting is, I've been fobbed off because that person doesn't know what to do with me. So I'm now getting pushed again to another organization. So it was to break down that barrier and that thought process with people. Everything is in confidence with our clients unless it's safeguarding related. Um, we accept that people have bad days and they just want to let off steam. So when they tell us to F off, it doesn't mean that we do, whereas lots of organizations will, or if they are really kicking off one day that we revisit them the next and say what was all that about because uh, again other organizations would just write them off as being violent that they don't deserve services and then that adds to even more frustration so they get barred from doctor surgeries they're not allowed to go to the council offices um, because we're not statutory we can robustly challenge inappropriate behavior um, and also the support we provide is there for as long as the person has that will and want to change and wants to engage with us. And as long as they bring something to the party, we will be there. So there is no, this is the 12 steps, this is 10 week process, this is a 16 week process, this is for people for as long as they want to change. And some people we've now been supporting for two to three years because they still need that sort of steady hand. And as it says there, we aim to leave people with hope and confidence to lead a happier and more fulfilling life um, and making them feel safer and improve their circumstances. So our criteria is very open. Um, we'd rather say yes than no. It's open to anybody, doesn't matter about their background. Um, over 18, unless we agree to take people on who are under 18, uh, as long as they don't pose an immediate and obvious threat to the person and that they have that will and want to change and capacity to change um, because otherwise if they actually quite enjoy their life the way it is there's nothing we can do about that 
Um, so based on those 52 people at the very start, we did a treatment site of 11 based in Darlington in County Durham, which has a population of around uh, 90 odd thousand. Um, and of those 11 people, they had made 355 calls uh, coming in at just over 3,000 staff hours. There's the cost there. And of those 11, nine agreed to engage. So we engaged with them with our first cohort of uh, trained volunteers. And this was the demand reduction. Um, over the period that we engaged with them, because we were given six months, um, the calls went over that period down from 355 to 77. Um, the amount of hours went down significantly and the cost also significantly went down to uh, just over 19,000 pounds. So we could base on, on that analysis that the by engaging with somebody at their level when they wanted it and being them there for them in a bespoke support that they, they knew that they could change. And we could then compare with the over that six month period that uh, with the rest of the treatment site, the rest of the people, the, the, that cohort of 52, that the 41 um, high impact users show, showed that their behavior remained the same, whereas we'd had a massive reduction. Um, the big thing we learned is we, it's not a negative thing. We expect our clients to fail. We don't say, if you call, we're never gonna support you again. We're there for them. They will test you. They will see if you're up to your word because they've been let down so many times before. We accept their failure. Uh, and when they fall, we, you know, if they fall off the wagon, if they take some more gear, if they continue to call, if they still go out and commit crime, then we will still be there to support them as long as they say, listen, I'm, you know, I do want to change. That was just a blip. So we're there to catch them. What we find is that that gap um for, first of all that the the amount of times they fall the fall isn't as far and the, the gap in between gets longer and longer as long as they sort of buying into the whole process and we proved the concept and based on that we were asked if we could roll it out um by may 17 we've done all our analysis and response and uh, and and everything else that uh, by 2018, we were then covering the whole of County Durham. And that was at that time just for vulnerable and isolated people who are high impact users. But as over the last, well, since that's happened since 2018, as our capacity grew, more paid staff, because it just started off with me, I now have eight uh, paid staff. We have over 100 volunteers. Um, and we constantly revisit the community client and organization. And based on that, we are now asked to take on which is where David's brilliant training came in, was around, we've, uh, we've now got, uh, with our local NHS, we're doing a two-year pilot around mental health, drugs and alcohol, but good of David's training is for any addiction. So we also now take on gambling. We've been asked to take on antisocial behaviour, and we also provide mediation, um, as well as um, we've just started doing another pilot with the county council with money from the government, for hard to reach families uh, to support young people, which is, it just shows, as somebody said today, every time you're talking about it, when they notice a gap in, in services, it's because invariably those people who fall in the gaps are the ones that are, are, are a pain, that are difficult, and nobody really knows what to do with them. And whereas before they were just left because it said, well, it's not our fault, they didn't meet our criteria, at least now they can send them on to us. And if that person wants to change, we will certainly give them a hand and see what we can do. So as of um, last, uh, of the 31st, um, we had had now over 3,000 referrals. We engage with around 74% of the people who referred to us. And with our vol brilliant volunteers, we've um, provided over 260,000 days of support for individuals. And we don't cherry pick. It doesn't matter how difficult they are because my belief is if somebody wants to change, it doesn't matter how bad their past is, what their past is, if they want to change, then you're already halfway there. It's like with counselling. As soon as you admit that you've got an issue or an addiction and you want to address it, that's part of the, that's you're halfway there. So it doesn't, you know, if somebody says, I, I want to get off this merry-go-round, I want to stop getting arrested, I want to stop committing crime, 
yeah, we'll give you support and let's help you do that. And we don't tell them what to do, like the white coats, the police, probation, social services. We ask them what do they want to do and how do they want to live their lives? And we then use the GROW model. So the, as long as they can set a goal and they have the will and want to change, so that's the G and the W, the R and the O in the middle is how realistic is that goal? And what are the different opportunities that we can give them to achieve that? Um, so that's what we would sort of bring along to the party. So we did an in-depth analysis on 150 of our clients for demand reduction over a three-year period. And you, we saw there that over, based on that 150 clients, we saved nearly 2,500 police incidents, which again is around 47,000 staff hours, which is significant. Um, and the saving of over 2.8 million again, which is significant for the police. But the big one for me is that 56 of those people didn't call the police again or didn't feel the need to call the police again, which is a very positive thing. And Jim, that what a difference to the- staggering. Yes. Yeah. They are staggering. 2,492 police incidents, saving yeah. at least 47,090 staff hours, yeah. estimated savings, Two million eight hundred and sixty thousand nine hundred and ten quid. That's yes. a hell of a lot of money. Well, and, it is. Yeah. And fifty six of it haven't called the called the police again. Wow. No. Sorry, I just wanted to. No. It it is, and and it's <coughs> um, you know the if you look at community, client, and organisations. If you look at those, the difference that that's going to make to that individual, the fact that 56 people who went from making all those calls to not feeling the need to call the police again um, is massive. And, it, you know, what a difference it makes to their lives. Also, the fact that police staff haven't had to go around and engage with that person, which invariably is negative. You know? And therefore, if you're the neighbour, you don't see the police outside your house every day, you know, and if it's if it's negative engagement, that's going to have an effect on your house prices because things are now recorded around antisocial behaviour and the amount of crime in your area. So again, by revisiting those and making sure that we do stay positive towards our client um, or clients, then you know that's the difference we can make. These these numbers um, come to show that this is based on. Uh, 900, as it says there, 953 people who had contact with the police. And between those 953 were uh, responsible for nearly 12,000 calls and one client making over 112 contacts. And what we do is we check all police interactions 12 months before we engage with them. And then what we compare it against is for the whole of the time we're supporting them. So if we're supporting somebody for two years, we count that against what they were before and then plus six months afterwards so that we can say that we have had a positive thing so we don't engage with somebody for a week close them down and go oh look we've saved all this we continue to monitor them for six months after we stopped engaging with them and the the quarter on quarter savings for the last four years is around 82 percent uh, demand reduction and of those 953, 480 haven't called the police again. Um, and they're the other savings, 185,000 staff hours and 10.7 million. And so for every pound that's been invested so far by the Police and Crime Commissioner, the savings around uh, 10 pound 30, um, which I thought wasn't very good. However, experts have told me that that is brilliant. So um, I'll go with their assessment rather than mine. And that's that's really it, you know, that where we are now, um, we were awarded uh, the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service. Uh, the big thing with us is that I tell this to every person that I do an interview with and I interview all our volunteers, is that they are the backbone of the community peer mentors. We co I concentrate on the volunteers because sadly the clients will always be there. So I don't have to concentrate on them. Uh, concentrate on the volunteers. We provide the volunteers with the opportunity to change their lives. If they're good enough to give up their time, and most of them 
with, because of their lived experience, because they are victims, survivors, perpetrators, um, they make the difference. Because when they sit across the table from somebody, if I'm sitting there, there, that person would probably be thinking, well, how do you know? You don't know what it's like to be homeless. You don't know what it's like to have an addiction. You don't know what it's like to be a victim of domestic abuse. All these things. But when the person sitting across from the table says, well, no, actually, I've been in prison and I have been homeless and I have had an addiction. I have been sectioned. I'm now in recovery. That bond between those people is huge. And that's one of the reasons we won this award, because our volunteers, quite a few of them, their CVs are blank. I went to school, got excluded, went to prison. That could be their CVs. We now provide them with qualifications. We give them a status. It improves them as individuals, lay them learn, learn skills. And of our clients, we've now had over 30 who were clients who have become volunteers. Quite a few of the volunteers have now gone on to get um, uh, paid jobs. And we had three last year that went back into higher education because of the confidence we'd given them around that support. And so that is why I believe this whole approach is successful because of the great volunteers we have. Um, we introduce, we introduce our own website, which everybody is uh, more than welcome to go and have a look at. There's a brilliant video on there about Laura's story, um, to, which is very moving and tells you how the difference that it's made to her. Um, and we introduce this to make it easier for a single front door approach so that people can not only uh, refer themselves or professionals can refer people, but people can also volunteer there. Um, since 2019, which is obviously pre-pandemic, you can see there that over nearly 350% increase in referrals, but the demand reduction since 2016, quarter on quarter is around 82%. Um, since we've taken on alcohol and substance misuse, thanks to David's training, we've seen a 230% increase in referrals for drugs and alcohol, but also that hidden addiction of gambling. And the big thing about gambling is that invariably there are outward signs if somebody has got alcohol and substance misuse. The, the gambling is that, that very distressing, if you like, substance that is, it doesn't taste, it doesn't smell and you can't see it. That's what makes gambling until it all goes horribly wrong. And when it does go horribly wrong, invariably it's either, it leads to then people self-medicating with drugs, alcohol. Um, it leads to domestic abuse. It can lead to committing crime. It can, you know, because people fall into this horrible pit of gambling. Um, volunteers and all staff are trained in neighborhood resolutions, recovery coach training, advocacy, um, and all the staff are also trained as uh, um, mental health first aiders. So as it says there, every day is a school day. We keep challenging, we keep changing, and we keep problem solving because, and also the advocacy of being able to go back to organizations and saying, did you know that Jim had this problem in their lives? Because how people present in front of the police it's, they don't have the chance, nor do lots of professionals. Your GP, for instance, has, has you for like seven to nine minutes, don't they? So you, you're not going to get to the root cause of why that person is behaving the way they are. We often get historical disclosures of sexual and domestic abuse, of uh, childhood sexual exploitation, uh, adverse experiences for children. Um, and then you can follow that path backwards and say, right, well, let's try and fix what we possibly can to make that person better for the future. Um, and that's why, you know, you can't help but enjoy every day. And that's my contact details. If anybody would uh, like to speak to me about any of it, we've introduced this uh, and provided support for 17 police forces um, to introduce this across the country. And as somebody said to me this morning, um, we fill the gaps where everybody else have given up on individuals. So I don't know if we should change our name to polyfiller. Um, but the, the, you know, if that's how people think, you know, we've got a difficult person here, nobody wants to engage with them, who can we give them to? And yeah, give them to us. And, and because it goes down to that individual. Yeah, and if they say to us, Jim, I want to change, I, I can't, I don't want to live my life like this anymore. 
then why wouldn't you want to help them? And unfortunately, lots of the statutory services go, you've had your chance, you know, you've let us down too many times. Um, and yeah, we do all the negative things to you. And that's not fair. And that's basically it in a, a whirlwind tour. Thank you very, very much. What, what, what do you think your biggest learning has been over the, between 2017 to 23? Um, the biggest learning would be the horrific negative impact of anxiety. Um, the, I don't think people appreciate the negative impact that anxiety has on people's lives. The fact that um, people, certainly society, society will ask people to do the most difficult things at the worst time in your life. You know, when you're grieving, when you've lost your job, when you're going to be made homeless, we ask them to fill out the most complicated forms. People ask the most stupid questions. You have to keep repeating your story. And then when you kick off, um, people say, well, you know, do you want support or not? Well, yes, they do. But what they don't need is somebody telling them something that they already know that, you know, being told you should come off alcohol and drugs because it's bad for you is that no shit Sherlock moment, really. I know that. And thanks very much for that, Mr. In your white coat with your big car and your nice house and your family and all the rest of it. But I don't know if I'm going to have somewhere to live tomorrow. I don't know if I can feed my kids. I don't know if my kids are going to be taken off me. And so people are offered stuff. They always say yes, because they believe that's what the professionals want to hear. And it is because that's the answer. Because if you say no, they have a big stick, which will mean you losing your house, your liberty, your children your money, all these things. But then when they don't turn up, people don't appreciate why. And the re reason why is anxiety, it is crippling. People go to bed for three days, not because they're lazy, but because they don't know what they're gonna confront. And we've all had that starting a new job. And if you're lucky enough to get a new job and you walk towards that place for the first time and you think, oh my goodness, what's it gonna be like? If you add into that, Am I going to lose my kids? Am I going to lose my money? Where am I going to get to my gear tonight? Am I got enough money for a drink? Am I going to be assaulted? Are they going to arrest me? You add that into somebody's anxiety, then that's why they don't turn up. And people will say, yes, I signposted Jim to this and Jim didn't turn up. So therefore I can wash my hands quicker than Pontius Pilate and say, well, that's not my fault. Jim didn't turn up because I gave him the name, the address, but you didn't give them the money to get on the bus. You didn't give them the bus timetable. So, you know, you didn't take into consideration that their phone run out, that they don't have access to stuff. No, you know, it's society sets sometimes people up to fail. Who are you angry with? Oh, I'm, I'm angry when we did the whole analysis and we won, we won uh, a number of awards. One of them was the National Problem, Police Problem Solving Award. We won that. And one of the big things which people didn't like is I identified on a, a problem analysis triangle, the perpetrators were professionals who set up criterias um, to, to make it look like they're doing something, but invariably can quite often set people up to fail. The individuals within those organizations are brilliant. They want to help people, but if it's too difficult and you work within your boundaries, then, that there isn't that problem solving approach isn't it that nobody will take a risk uh, anymore uh, to do it do i give this person 10 quid because they said they need it for the bus or are they going to go and buy some more gear um but you you know sometimes you've just got to get to know that person a bit better and uh, as i say when you look at most of our clients it's because they've been let down by everybody who should have supported them you know the the person that abused them is invariably a, a family member. Um, the person who took advantage of them is probably a partner. The person that's assaulted them is probably known to them and thought they were a friend. So why would they trust somebody in authority? And so you have to build up that, that relationship and get them to believe that something that seems um, too good to be true isn't too good to be true. And quite often the people who are really down don't believe that they deserve that and so again it's convincing them that they do deserve to be happy to be secure to be safe and, and i think that's what our numbers show
And where, and where does your compassion come from? Oh, I've no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I've no idea. It's I mean, just always been there. Advocate, huh? Oh well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 what, what's the next step? The now next we, step. I like. I wanted to say, yeah. okay, you've saved all this money. What do they spend that money on now? Oh well, there's a good question. Well, they they pump more and more money into us. I mean, when this started, it the the part I was employed for a short period, and there was thirty thousand pound budget, and that was that. The, the budget for us now is over £250,000 a year. So they obviously see the value in it. Okay. So, so, that, so that's about 10% of what you saved? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you say you've, you've uh, taken this out to 17 other police stations? Police forces across the country, yes, who okay. have introduced something similar okay. in different Oh, gosh. Uh, Thames Valley, Surrey, um, uh, West Mercia, Cleveland, Northumbria, um, Oxford itself with different councils. Um, yeah, it uh, sort of the list goes on really. And sometimes they just do that proof concept. We we did training for North Yorkshire and um, for Hertfordshire. Um, and are you guys coming together and collaborating? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're constantly contacted. And then the the fact is, as I've said to people, this isn't an empire building. We don't charge people anything for it. I, I just send them all our lessons learned so they don't make the same mistakes that, you know, I did. Let's get to that point quicker. Why, why reinvent a wheel if it's going to help people? Okay. Well, you must send me to them. <laughs> I do, constantly. <laughs> uh, all right. Is that okay, David? That's that's fantastic. That's uh, brilliant. That's it. So people can reach out to you, contact you. We can please do. We yes. Can send this video around and uh, brag about you. Bless you. That'd be great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are you checking out? I see we're coming up to to the hour. Yeah. Um, I'm checking out just yet. Yeah, just um, I'm just going out to see a client or a new client with some the uh, police colleague that's got himself into a bit of trouble. So I'm looking forward to that and uh, seeing how an old man can help a young boy who um, probably just needs a bit of mentoring because they haven't had any positive influences in their lives. So um, we'll see how that goes. It's always good fun. <laughs> I, I'll check out with a lot of gratitude. Pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Lovely to see you.